a lot of people are worried that old companies and the old tech companies are going to dominate again. This is one of those cycles where the new companies that become the, the Fortune 500s 20 years from now are spawned. And that's because they're going to be more agile and they're going to look at AI and how you communicate with things much differently. So. Dan Jeffries, it's great to have you on DataFrame. Thanks so much for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Likewise. So you are the Managing Director of the AI Infrastructure Alliance and former CIO at Stability AI. You also have a pretty awesome substack that I recommend everyone to read called Future History. A lot of that. Uh, you know, you're such a prolific thinker and writer about AR, AI. There's so many directions I can take our conversations in. But what I want to deep dive with you on is exactly what you mean here by MBA AI is how AI will become the interface for a lot of work that we do and really how we interact with software as we know it. So maybe here to deep dive a bit more, walk through what you mean by AI being the interface for the world or work. And how do you think that will play out more deeply in practicality over the coming years? So I want to give credit where credit is due. I stole the inter AI will be the interface to the world idea from the brilliant Francois Cholet, uh, who's the author of Keros, a brilliant thinker in and of himself, uh, who I had the privilege to meet you know, one time uh, you know, early in my kind of AI career. He was, and I just thought he was a brilliant fellow. Uh, and so I loved that idea. And it made perfect sense to me. The idea that basically we're going to talk to this thing. Like it was kind of like Snoop Dogg is up there, uh, you know, all the conversations. You're like, man, I can understand this thing. Like, I can talk to this motherfucker. You know what I mean? And like, <laughs> and like, and like, it can talk back to me. You know, like, <laughs> this is like, am I in a movie right now or what? Right. And that, you know, to me, that is like, exact. That's awesome, right? That he Snoop Dogg is brilliant too, and he kind of really yeah. nailed it. And and to me, I think the more you can kind of chat. Like right now, you have these. A lot of people are worried that old companies and the old tech companies are going to dominate again. This is one of those cycles where the new companies that become the, the Fortune 500s 20 years from now are spawned. And that's because they're going to be more agile. And they're going to look at AI and how you communicate with things much differently. So, you know, right now, you know, you have pe the big companies being very conservative with their chatbots, right? They're going to make sure that you go to that, re that sort of recipe site or whatever. But who the heck wants to go to that recipe site when it's become, you know, just a, you know, six pop-up ads and like, and add every other paragraph. It's like, it's super annoying. So as soon as a company comes along and is like, man, you know, we're going to make this, this interface you chat and tell it what kind of food you're in and what your dietary restrictions are or whatever. And it's like, boom, here's three things that you can, you can eat without ever going there and involves a new business model, right? In other words, the old business model will sort of take down a little bit. It's not going to be totally destroyed. That's crazy. But like a new business model that supports this, we don't know what that'll be, but it'll, it'll evolve over time. As soon as that comes, that starts to displace the old way of thinking about it. And they've got the innovators still over. They get stuck, right? Just like Kodak is like, well, we've been working on this film for 100 years. Like, this digital thing looks cool, but like it kind of messes with the original business. So let's not go too far. And then somebody else who doesn't care about that comes along and replaces them. So I think, you know, just being able to naturally converse with things, you know, bringing in, you know, so I think somebody recently said that, you know, that there won't be any programmers. I totally disagree. I, I, I agree with David Ah that maybe there's going to be a billion programmers, you know, and it's just like, I'm a crappy web designer. I can use Photoshop. I can use some other things. I'm ter I couldn't write the XML, but you give me a drag and drop editor. I can all of a sudden put together some pretty cool websites. I think we're going to have more people programming like that. I think we're going to have more people being able to talk to their applications and it understands them and, and, and becomes kind of a, you know, a friend in a way. Right. And I, I think this is super exciting. I think that's how most software is going to function. We don't, you know, whether it's always talking or typing in, who knows, but we're going to be able to increasingly just kind of describe what it is that we need and, and get better and better output from there that we can iterate with and work on. You know, that, that to me is exciting. You think about even an artist, you know, maybe a, a, a guitar player playing a song, iterating and going, okay, give me 30 continuations of that. And it goes, okay, listen, listen, listen. Oh, number seven is cool. Yeah, let me, let me try that. Okay, you know what? I just changed this note. Give me like 15 variations on that. Right. Like that kind of stuff, that kind of co-collaborative relationship with AI is going to be a very exciting thing for everybody, I think. That's really exciting. And the co-collaborative experience that you're talking about rests in a lot of ways in great user experience and user interface design. In a lot of ways, you mentioned the neutron bomb of ChatGPT. You know, one of the reasons why ChatGPT was so widely used is not just because the model is very performant and, you know, the quality of the output, the, the time to value when you get a high quality output is really low, right? 
but also the interface of the chat, the user experience, the iteration time, the feedback loop that you get when you're talking, like speaking or chatting with ChatGPT is pretty, pretty great. And you get a lot of aha moments. And that's one of the reasons why it took off so quickly. Uh, so maybe in your opinion, what constitutes the ideal interface and experience for an AI model as we interact with it? You know, I don't know that anybody knows the answer to this question right now, uh, because I think UI, you experience, the creative process is an iterative process. I was just having this conversation where, you know, I was talking with someone about, you know, a program who was working on, a, you know, idea I was working on. And, you know, my friend said, well, he, you know, he's kind of developing. I said, well, he's working on my idea. And he said, she said, well, it's different, though, than what you originally, you know, created. I'm like, that's the creative process, right? Like, it's it, when I start out writing a novel or whatever, it doesn't end up exactly the same way as when I sort of originally planned it, right? It's, there's this co-creative kind of thing that happens. So I think that's happening. That's going to happen with the UI UX as we go along. We're going to iterate and we're going to go along and we're going to say, wait a minute, this is, this is a new way to do things. And that maybe the best way I ever think about that is, uh, you know, my friend Chris Dixon, who I knew when, when, I was, when we were sort of very young um, and, you know, is now famous, you know, famous investor or whatever. Um, he, you know, he was a programmer at the time and he, the, the stylus had just come out on these kind of, you know, non-internet connected pad thingies that we had. And, and most of the people were designing video games on it as like, you know, click and type stuff, which was the dominant UI UX at the time. And he made a little, like kind of a space invader style game where he had to like circle the, you know, the attacking aliens, you know, with the stylus. And he was, he was said, look, you got to utilize the new capabilities of, right, of like the interface, right? And I think that's the creative process. I think that's what happens. The more people play with these things, the more we're going to get an understanding of what the ideal interface will be over time. And then when it happens, you'll be like, oh, well, of course, right? But, and that's, that's, that, that's the idea of like any invention. It always looks so obvious in retrospect. That's how you're going to know like that we've gotten there. But I, I don't know precisely what it's going to look like just yet. Yeah, and what's very exciting here is that we take a lot of, you know, software and tools that we use right now for granted, right? You know, apps are designed, you know, we've kind of reached consensus of what makes a great application on, an, on a phone, right? In terms of a user interface and a user experience. But we had to learn that as the iPhone was released and as the App Store kind of evolved and apps became uh, more and more ubiquitous. And we're doing that same process with AI right now, right? So... We're seeing more and more AI being embedded in every software stack. It's becoming truly transformational. You know, we've seen scary good applications of AI and tools like Word, Excel. And I think that has a lot of potential to change how we work in general. So maybe how do you see that transformation happening? What do you think our relationship will work, will look like once AI, once ambient AI becomes more ubiquitous? I mean, the change will happen gradually and then all at once, right? I mean, that's, that's sort of, if you look at that diffusion of innovation curve, you know, which famously came out in the, the late 60s that looked at like how ideas and technology disseminate, right? And it's, it's been repurposed for every business presentation on the planet, right? But I think most people miss that it's like you have these pioneers, you have these early adopters, you have the early majority, the late majority, the laggards. And, you know, at each point in time, it becomes something where you're like, well, I, I don't know, that doesn't make any sense. I don't know why I'd ever use that to, oh, that's kind of interesting. I started to use it. To like, well, I'm using it every day. To I can't imagine my life without it. But that's that's the the sort of progress. And I, I, you know, I kind of changed my mind. Maybe in some respects, in that I, you know, as you were talking just now, I was thinking back to that scene in Blade Runner, which was totally science fiction, where he where he has the photo of the of the gal and he puts it in there, and he says, okay, you know, pan twenty three to sixteen right, okay, and you know, go no, go back. Right. And like, you know, the software is kind of moving around and searching through. He's like, OK, enhance 23 to 15, you know, boom, 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 boom. And, you know, there were kind of two sci fi things in there that were impossible for one was enhancing a photo, which is in every stupid crime drama of all time. And, you know, you're like, OK, you're like, oh, we took this low resolution VHS footage and, <laughs> yeah. and got a high. And it's, and it's but, HD. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, like HD, we L noticed there's a cat in the L back. Yeah, yeah. Right, you know, looked like <laughs> look, looked at the reflection of a car, of a car <laughs> yeah. window. Yeah. And then, yeah. Right. right. Mm -hmm. But now, like with kind of the generative models, like there's a possibility that they could fill in some of this case. And that, that, that idea of him talking to it, he's like, OK giving it these specific commands. Okay, do this, do this. Okay, no, wait, go back, which is a very human command, right? To go back. 
I think we'll be able to sort of talk to it. I think we'll be able to have those kinds of things that are available, you know, and, and this sort of gesture to it, move things around like that. Like if you see the, the, the interface in her, by the way, where he was kind of, there's no controller and he's just sort of walking and then he's talking to it and they're having, you know, the character and him are having an argument. I think that that's how it starts. Uh, you know, that's how it starts again. So I think I kind of backtracked this out of the, the initial question, you roll back to the, you know, to the last one, um, you know, but that was sort of my, my thinking. Again, this stuff happens slowly and then it kind of happens all, all at once. Sometimes it feels like the cycle is sped up a little bit uh, these days, right? And that uh, we're so used to technology that there is kind of an acceleration point. And so, you know, we adapt it faster. And I think, you know, I was of the, you know, the Gen X generation where I, I lived without all this ubiquitous technology and then it kind of gradually came into my life and now it's a total part of life. So I'm kind of on this weird edge. Whereas I see a lot of younger folks who are like, they'll pick up a new platform and then abandon the old one overnight. Be like, well, we switched everyone over to this and they'll, they can learn it, you know, as, as if it's like, you know, I don't know, as if it were just like, always there. It's like a tree or anything else. They just know how to interact with it. So there is like even a faster acceleration of how we even adapt this stuff. So uh, it, it has kind of compressed the time there, which is exciting, I think. I'm envious of. Yeah, indeed. And if you look at ChatGPT, like ChatGPT's adoption and how we talk about talk about ChatGPT and think about it, it's crazy to think that this has only been available since November 2022, right? Or something along those lines, right? It's It's been less than a year, but it's become so ubiquitous and so widely used. Uh, no, I think this marks a great segue to discuss how you think the AI ecosystem will evolve in the next few years, right? We've talked about applications of AI in tools in the software stack. In a lot of ways, it's interesting because we're seeing technology incumbents move quickly, yet conservatively, as you mentioned, to adopt AI in their products. Uh, there's a lot of competition right now in terms of, you know, foundation models, AI profi- infrastructure providers. I'd love to learn your thoughts about how you think about the different players in the industry today. And how do you see things playing out in the next few years? I see, you know, I see the research moving tremendously quickly on a lot of different things. And, and that's primarily because you have, you know, traditional researchers empowered with like models they can pick up and tune uh, versus having to have all the money to train it from scratch. And, you know, the failure rate can be really high there. So that's accelerating research, which is exciting. I think that'll pick up with the open source, you know, foundation models. And, and we're already seeing a lot of that, that cool research. I think you're also starting to see a ton of developers, traditional developers, coders get into it. They bring a different perspective, which is exciting. And they're able to do things that you, you might not see in traditional data science, merging 26 models together or whatever. And, and you know, and data scientists going, well, that's crazy. It's going to collapse the model. Then it does. It makes a better model, right? So these kinds of like, these kinds of engineering things, this is a, marks a different phase in any technological development. You know, it's one person who comes up with a way to, uh, you know, extract nitrates or whatever uh, from the air with the, in, in Germany, but then it's engineers that make it this scalable platform where you can build, uh, uh, you know, something that you can sell repeatedly and, and crank out in a, in, a, in a ubiquitous way. So I think we're seeing that same thing now of developers and engineers learning about this stuff and bringing their own perspective, which is super, you know, super exciting. Um, I see the foundation models as being a really cost-intensive business. I think it, it's costly in terms of people, time, uh, you know, a compute. Uh, I think we have to get, there has to be a breakthrough in terms of making the models smaller or maybe even learning by example. You know, I was reading the, I always follow the DARPA stuff because they're always like 10 years ahead of the curve. And, you know, they were funding like, you know, they're funding stuff like how does AI learn in novel situations and uh, be able to adapt to a completely new situation. And they describe it as like, you know, you learn chess, but then the rules of chess completely change underneath from you. How do you, how do you deal with it? And today's AI can't do that. And I was watching a, like a liquid AI um, network that was based on like C. Elegans brain. And it was able to be like thrown into a novel situation in a drone and able to find itself. Whereas a transformer was like, ah, and this is a forest. I was trained, I was trained on the city. I don't know what to do. So I, I think we're going to see kind of new breakthrough research developments. I think we're going to see the refinement of the old stuff. What I'm really seeing a lack of is as fast as the research and all these ideas are coming in, the infrastructure for AI is really, really primitive. Like when I, because I spent a lot of my life in infrastructure, you know, I had an IT consulting company, I was at Red Hat, you know, for a decade, uh, you know, and I was an MLOps. So I've seen a ton of these kind of like go from bare metal to virtualization to containers, you know, all these 
monitoring and management and security tools. We have none of that in AI, right? And when I look at, like, I even looked the other day, I was like, cool, I, we want to try out a bunch of the open source models. And it was like, cool, spin up, you know, a single instance on an A100 or a two-way A100, charged by the hour, two fifty an hour, $38,000 a year to run a single instance. I'm going, this is crazy. Why isn't anybody spun up, you know, a bunch of these models and parallelized access to them and charged on a per token basis? They're not even there yet, you know, right? And, and then there's all kinds of other things I see that are missing. I think we need a red hat of AI. In fact, I was thinking strongly about starting this as a business. I just don't want to get up and do it every day. Um, so I'm not going to do it. I'm giving this away freely. Listen closely. I think, um, you know, we had all this stuff in traditional code, the open source stack, where you could rapidly fix bugs and where you like added skills or, or upgrades to it. I think AI is going to need a similar thing where you need bug fixes and skill pack upgrades, meaning, okay, we added medical knowledge to this transformer. And, you know, this model just is advising people to commit suicide. Okay, great. How do we like fine tune the heck out of that rapidly, you know, uh, or example it out? Like take the original model, ask it the same question of why you should never commit suicide. Hear that answer with the original question, generate a hundred versions of each question and answer. Surface 2% to a person. Okay, take that out, take that out, take that out. Great. Fine tune yourself rapidly output a bug fix. And that's got to be an order of magnitude faster than traditional code because we are going to have, you could, these things are so open-ended. Whereas in the past, you're like, well, this is a, you know, this is an SSL, you know, library or whatever. You can only fail in these ways. You can fail in a lot of ways. So I think we need, not just people who are going to run the inference of these things, but people are going to be able to support these things and the community builds around that of rapid fine-tuning and rapid iteration and rapid pickups so that when I you know, as a user, as an enterprise order, I'm able to get that model. I'm going to have 200 LORAs or 1,000 LORAs. I don't, I don't even know the upper scale of how many LORAs you can add without degrading it or adapters in general. I use LORA because that was the first adapter I ever came across, but I really mean adapters. I don't know whether it's adapter is the answer and whether they become hot swappable, whether it becomes a mixture of experts, whether it's fine-tuning. I don't know, but I know that we have a long way to go in terms of the infrastructure and support. And then the middleware, I talk to a lot of companies right now building the middleware, like how do you parallelize, you know, or cache these kinds of things? You know, how do you deal with prompt injections? I see that almost being like an anti new antivirus business with heuristics, anti, you know, like neural nets or whatever, essentially saying like, okay, this is a prompt injection, stop this on both sides of the equation in the pipeline. I see all this middleware and support, uh, you know, monitoring and management, all this kind of stuff. None of this stuff exists. And to some degree, we're really starting from scratch because this stuff is non-deterministic. And so it's not enough to just take your monitoring software and dump it on an LLM. You know, you are going to need a new kind of monitoring that's able to detect logic flaws, right? For instance, like, well, this, I asked it to go get a present uh, for me, for my sister. And like, it's off there buying, uh, you know, I don't know, um, I don't know, a baseball bat, you know, or it's like, you know, talking to someone else or it's, you know, it's doing something or it's just outputting garbage text, right? So we're going to need all kinds of new sort of middleware, monitoring management infrastructure. It's going to be a whole new industry. It's going to take a bit of time, just like it took a bit of time for us to figure out how to scale web scale applications. You know, in the beginning, they're like, well, you throw a single database at it and whatever, and that's not good enough. All of a sudden you get sharded databases and, you know, distributed applications and load balancers. It's going to be the same kind of progression for dealing with these non-deterministic systems. It's going to take a, it's going to take some time, uh, and, I, and I don't know how fast it comes together. There's definitely a lot to unpack here, uh, and you know maybe as you point out all the different kind of challenges and the limitations we currently have in the AI stack, what do you think is the most pressing aspect of the AI infra infrastructure stack that needs to be fixed within the next few twelve months to be able to scale the adoption of AI and large language models in general? Uh, so I, I think you need to start getting to the point where the, you know, again, you have a, you know, additional models that you need. You need the basic middleware in place to kind of deal with them. I think you need some sort of upgrade process that's much more clear. When I see stuff like OpenAI, they're like, well, we deprecated the old model. Uh, you got two weeks. Good luck. That is totally unacceptable. It's not going to work. Uh, you're going to have to have these kind of longer lived models because the, the, if you just upgrade the model, it can rapidly degrade your application, developers need the chance to say, great, here are the last six versions 
of GPT or Claude or, or whatever, yes, if one of them is considered a security upgrade or something like that, then that has to be there. But in general, you can't just have, oh, we swapped out the old one and like now your application that used to summarize text perfectly has now fallen off by 75% overnight and good luck. That's absolutely not going to work. And so I, that's the kind of that basic level stuff is totally missing and has got to be fixed in the next six to 12 months for this to become viable. And what you're mentioning here, specifically on that example with OpenAI, you know, is one of the limitations of closed sourced API providers, right, that we see here. And I think the segue to my next question pretty well is on the trade-offs between open source and closed source models, right? Uh, a lot of discussion now in the industry about, hey, should we work with an open AI? Should we fine-tune? Should we, you know, build a large language model from scratch? Um, how do you imagine these trade-offs will evolve in the next few months, right? Where do you, what do you advise companies looking to leverage large language models to start? Well, look, I, I think OpenAI is not going to be the only game in town for in anywhere. You know, you're going you're gonna to have Minstrel, you're going to have Pi, and you're going to have uh, Claude. We already had Claude 2. It looks, and I, my programmer was already telling me that it's, it looks like it's much better at coding already. So, like, you, you've got the open source models. Llama is probably going to come out with a commercial viable version. Uh, you know, you've got Gorilla, you've got these other kind of like open source models. So there's going to be a proliferation of models um, that are going to be viable, uh, you know, for people. Uh, I think that's tremendously exciting. I don't want to see sort of one kind of group kind of dominate along these things. And, uh, you know, open source, you know, we're going to talk more about open source later. But I, I think to me, the open source is tremendously important because that lets the it lets the developers and the and the reg and the you know researchers who aren't maybe the researchers making you know twenty million dollars, two million dollars, million dollars that are everyone's competing for. But you know what? Not everybody who is super smart or has a great idea is already at that level in their career, right? There's a ton of regular folks out there, you know, in, everyday researchers who might have a breakthrough because they have access to the weights and they can now go try out an idea that maybe that was too far out and they weren't going to get funding for in kind of a traditional, very expensive, eclectic, you know, foundation model company. And, uh, and now they have the opportunity to do that. And if you look at that, there's a perfect example in, in the stable, commution, stable diffusion community. We'll talk about that more later too. But one of the things that I thought was really interesting is the LoRa paper was made for large language models and the community adopted it for diffusion models to the point that I saw a Reddit on the stable diffusion community where the the paper writer of Laura was there going, hey, I never thought to do this. I want to do a new version that takes into account a larger stack of models. I want to talk to the community to understand what works, what sucks, what's better, right? That kind of fast feedback that happens from the open source and the house is super, super important. And it's why open source eventually ends up eating, eating the lunch of things in the long term. So do you think that open source it like ultimately in the long run will eat the like the lunch of like the large language model providers of today? Yeah, so I think so I think right now so this there's a couple of ways this future can play out. I like to do kind of a Monte Carlo analysis of the future and have like these sort of hard branches. There's there's a lot of this sort of weird lawsuit stuff happening right now where the people are trying to redefine copyright um and uh you know there's a I I didn't fully expect that. I w I saw a lot of prop, you know challenges or, or protests or things like that. But what I didn't see uh, was, you know, these kind of lawsuits and this sort of, I'm an artist for a long time and I, I, have, I have no problem with sort of artificial intelligence, but a number of artists and other copyright holders are suddenly like up in arms about it. So depending on how that plays out, my general sense is that the artificial intelligence industry is way too important to the world economy in the future for it to fall on the side of not allowing sort of public domain or, or, or public, you know, scraping. I think I'm, you know, I think it just falls on that kind of naturally over the long term, but that's going to play out and that's going to play out and, and that's going to affect the trajectory of whether open source kind of is held back for a decade or whether, you know, uh, AI is held back for a decade. It could change how the research works and force us down the path of like doing kind of a liquid neural net train by example kind of thing. Uh, in the same way, I take a kid out in the back, throw a ball to him and after a couple of weeks, he knows how to throw the ball. Maybe he's not going to the major leagues, but he knows how to throw a ball. So, I, you know, that could change your trajectory. So I'm watching that kind of closely. Um, the other thing is right now it's really, really expensive. And, and I would say 
in the short term, the proprietary has a big advantage. And they have the big advantage and they hire the best people. They can buy the supercomputer. Um, you know, they can get all the data. They can be quiet, quiet about it. Um, and they can license a bunch of data, you know. So they have a big advantage over the open source providers. My general sense, though, is that open source over a long enough timeline generally wins out. Gen open source it's this weird, ugly, gnarly kind of thing. And, and I love it, right? It's like messy. You know, you look at the early days of Linux, which I spent a lot of time with, and you go, you're like, how the hell is this shit ever going to beat Solaris? Like, it's fucking crap. And, you know, I got to compile my own thing. Like, it barely works. Like, the old gray beards at the time were like, this will never disgrace you to shoot fours, <laughs> you know, you, you young whippersnappers. <laughs> and, you know, get out of here with this crap. You need an enterprise support contract. And, and, you know, so, but over time, the swarm of open source intelligence, right, starts to compact and like you get millions of developers and tens of thousands of developers working on this concept. Um, and it just becomes harder and harder for any proprietary company to build. You would never have been able to take all of Microsoft, Oracle's, Adobe's, everyone else's money at the time and pull it together and build the Linux kernel. You couldn't. And so over time, that openness, I think, ends up eating the world. And if you look at Linux today, you know, it runs everything. It, it, it runs supercomputers. It runs the entire cloud. Even Microsoft, which if they had been successful in the early days at like kippling it, crippling it would have short-sightedly crippled their business today, which is, you know, essentially runs around that, right? And, uh, and so I think that open source in the long enough timeline wins. Now, I don't know what, whether that's five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Um, I think the proprietary be, you know, companies have a, have a big advantage right now. Um, and, and that's typical in any ecosystem too, but I think long-term, uh, open source has a massive, you know, has a massive chance to disrupt. We may see even a third timeline where they kind of exist peacefully and, you know, and there are huge parts of the stack that are open source and some of it, that's just these very proprietary intelligences that are incredibly useful and hard to replicate. Uh, I think both of those can, that all of those are a possibility uh, as well. And it's kind of, it's one of these things that's sort of a bit up in the air at the moment. Okay, that's really fascinating insight. Uh, maybe touching upon the community aspect here, you know, your previous company, Civility AI, I think is a great example of an open source AI startup that has put itself on the map as an AI leader. You mentioned the community aspect of Laura, for example, uh, you know, from large language models to diffusion models. Maybe walk us through the community aspect, why it's so important for the progress of AI, how you saw it play out with Civility in a bit more detail, and why it's so crucial for the future success of AI products. Again, I think it's because you get uh, minds involved in the project who have not passed the gatekeepers of the kind of current state of the art. Um, what's nice about it, if you think about something like, for instance, when the Kindle came out and allowed direct publishing, there was, at that time, I remember as an art, you know, as a writer and writing novels with my, my group, there was a debate about whether you're a real writer if you publish directly or whether you published with one of the big six gatekeepers, right? And, uh, you know, that argument looks ridiculously stupid now. And, and open, you know, the Kindle allowed you to keep 70% of your profits. And then there was a high, there's hybrid publishers now. At the time, the gatekeepers were taking 90% of the profit and giving you 10. Okay. That's and, insane. And it's a totally insane. Nowadays, it's been much more democratized because of the openness of it. Yeah, you got more shit too, right? Okay, because you opened the floodgates, right? And the gatekeepers did do a good job of like, you know, being able to say, wait, I think this is great. But they still miss things. They, that's the thing about a gatekeeper is it is a limited choke. And I think that's the same thing with, with when you have open source and why the community becomes so important is people who might not be traditionally a part of machine learning or whatever get to contribute their ideas. And so I saw a lot of ideas in the community. Like, again, I mentioned earlier, they would like mash up like 20, 30 models and like get a better model. And a lot of researchers were like, that's crazy. It's not going to work. And then it did. And then you see that kind of idea filter back in traditional machine learning, where it's like, you know, they took Palm and they jammed together a vision transformer with it. And all of a sudden the robot could find itself around like unfamiliar environments and like, and they didn't do anything else. They didn't retrain it. Right. That was awesome. So I think that kind of feedback loop happens. The Laura paper, which I mentioned earlier, and the kind of feedback there, I think I, somebody did an analysis when I was still at Stability of how fast the community was integrating ideas from research papers. And research papers was something like 18 days 
they were like implementing the code and integrating it into the thing. And if it was like, if it was a, like a proprietary piece of software or, or a new idea that was ready to go, like they were, you know, or a plugin, they were integrating it in like a day, a day and a half, right? And so, you know, even look, you look something awesome like Automatic 11 or Comfy UI, which are two totally different interfaces, right? For how you interact with these things. One is that kind of, you know, uh, flowing, uh, you know, concept where you link together the different ideas and swap them out in Comfy Automatic, which is like the kitchen sink approach, right? Where you just throw everything in there, right? Um, but like it's at this kind of rapid iteration of trying of ideas uh, and new concepts and bringing in people who can't pass through the gatekeeping, but have an idea outside of the box that contributes to those things now. That's, that's interesting. I, I think I saw Andrew Carpathia or whatever speaking at, at the agents conference. And he was like, every time we see a paper inside OpenAI um, that is about some new technique or whatever, we're like, oh, there's somebody inside that's like, oh, well, we tried that two years ago. Here's why it doesn't scale or didn't work, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, every time we see an agent paper or something like that, we're like reading it like, like it's the great, like it's, I don't know, GRR Martin just put out, finally put out Winds of Winter, right? And, and he's like, because it's all new to us. It's all like, it's totally new stuff when people are doing these kind of agents. And that becomes from outsiders having that stuff. And then it gets even more important when it's open and you can have the weights. And now there's like dozens of adapters, right? That are like way more efficient now as people are like, well, maybe if we just tweak these weights or just this layer or this thing, or we insert it here, make it smaller, you know, these kinds of things cannot happen when you don't have access to the, to the full model. So open source to me is just tremendously, tremendously important. Uh, and I'm happy to see so many companies that uh, there's, you know, Red Pajama and uh, the, I guess there was, you know, Run AI was required and, you know, there's Databricks kind of pivoting towards that and doing some open data sets. Community collectives, there's Lion and there's the open chat, you know, group from that awesome podcaster. I forget his name. He's, but uh, uh, that stuff is super cool. And that comes out of just more access, more access. More access is so important. And we have this weird idea today of like, well, we've got to make sure that only these trusted people have access to stuff. Well, screw that. You know, like that, that, that system never works, right? We have three providers of people who, you know, are trusted with your credit card data. One of them lost all the data, you know, for half of the United States. They're still a trusted provider. That's, that's how gatekeeping works. You can't rip them out of the system. And so gatekeeping to me is, is garbage. I hate it. I think it's, I think it's a, it, it, it carries no water with me. This kind of idea of like, it's, it's only the trusted people who can, only can, can have this. It's, you know, but you, they, no, who, an organization is made up of human beings who might be trustworthy at the time. Those people can change over time and make that former institution that was trusted now totally untrustworthy. Okay, so I don't buy this crap at all. I, I think open source is critical. The more minds you have working on it, the better you get to alignment, the better you get to like things that are beneficial for all. Yeah, it's going to do some bad things. But just because Photoshop can put a head on a naked body does not mean we need to restrict Photoshop. It's stupid, right? It's like Linux is used for mal malware and hacking. It also runs every supercomputer in the cloud and nuclear subs. So I don't buy this whole concept of, well, Unless you can guarantee the kitchen knife will never stab anybody, you can't put it out. And I'm like, I'm like, wait a minute, like 99.999% of the people are going to cut vegetables. We have laws to arrest criminals. Uh, I don't understand this concept. So open source to me, people have got to get out of this mindset of that, you know, only the trusted people who could have access to this stuff. An, an impassioned defense of the open source AI <laughs> ecosystem here. Uh, and I think this marks a great segue to discuss, you know, AI risk in general, Doomer discourse, what we've been seeing a lot in the past, you know, few months when it comes to uh, potential AI risk and existential risk, right? Uh, we've seen a lot of high profile individuals call for the slowdown of AI development. And, you know, we've a few, talked about the not a lot. Uh, a few, yeah, a few. Uh, we've talked about the existential AI risk AI poses to humanity. Um, I think you have quite an opposite view here, you know, from your impassioned events of, of open source, but also in your writing, you argue for speeding up work in AI uh, as a means to reaching better AI safety. Maybe walk us through your line of thinking here and love to understand. Look, me and Mark and Dreesen, uh, you don't agree on this, right? Like, I, and uh, I, I think this stuff is just way too beneficial and too important. And, uh, and every technology from the sundial to like bicycles, children's teddy bears, has been shouted down as like the end of the world. Uh, I, you know, it hasn't happened yet. I don't buy that it's going to happen with this. 
I, I really, I really do not buy the, like, the far doomer. And I look, I'm a sci-fi writer. I love, you know, the singularity and all this kind of crazy stuff. I don't, you know, I don't know if it's actually going to happen, right? But, like, it might just be a cool literary construct. Um, but this whole concept of, like, you know, especially from the, you know, Udowski and all this kind of stuff of, like, oh, I can always tell when someone's kind of a member of the cult of Udowski when they're like, have you heard of orthogonal theory? I'm like, you mean the theory that, like, intelligence and niceness don't line up how long did it take you to think of that 10 seconds like that's not a that's not a theory okay that is nothing that is this blatant statement of something so obvious as to be pointless right to me that doesn't and and what i don't see is any alignment research when i see that thing when i see that called research that is not research that's philosophy okay i'm a writer about artificial intelligence you don't get to call me a researcher i've published no papers no mathematical theories no actual, like, I didn't invent reinforcement, okay? That's what I call a research. So when I, when I see, like, the, you know, the president of Anthropic, like, looking at this and going, like, this is absurd, that's the company where they, the, where the people were, like, left open air, where they're like, you guys aren't, you know, thinking about safety and alignment enough. Like, we're going and starting our own thing, right? They're, those are engineers working on a problem. I do not believe that you can solve a problem that does not exist in the future. Now, the way that problems are solved are a problem starts to happen, and then you as an engineer look at it and solve it in real time. We don't know, like the early days of refrigerators, where the gas would like occasionally leak and blow up. You don't know that's going to happen ahead of time. And you can't solve it until you're like able to look at it and go, well, we need to make the gas stronger. We need a different gas in there. We need to do these things. And slowly over time, you do that. We're starting to have real engineers look at the engineering, right? And to me, look, every technology exists on a sliding scale, okay, from good to evil, okay? A, 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 a lamp might be closer to the side of good, but I can still, I can light my house with it. It's really, I can still pick it up and hit you over the head with it. A gun might be closer to the side of evil. Right, it kills people in wars and all these kinds of horrible things and crimes. But I can still hunt, feed my family, defend myself. You know these kinds of things, right? So AI is right in the middle. It can do really terrible things. All this super intelligent doom stuff, you know, it detracts from the fact that like it can be used for like facial recognition against dissidents, or that it can be used like you know in in lethal weapons technology. You know, right now, right? In some cases, you might even be able to say. That's even an example of something that exists in a gray area and it's not black and white. Is it better to have a bomb that hits a, like, like wars are going to happen no matter how much we hate them and we don't want them to happen. Is it better to have a bomb that hits a building and blows up everybody in there when you're trying to find one target? Or is it better to have a little drone that zooms in, finds the thing and, you know, kills that one person? Uh, again, you could make the case even that that might be an advancement. Or you could make a case that this is just a horrific thing that we should never allow. But it, all this kind of doomerism stuff really detracts from these kinds of basic problems, and they're not solved by any of this philosophical nonsense. I, I don't think that that has any, it has any weight whatsoever. It's not research. It is a bunch of like people talking about stuff. I am going to go with the engineers. I'm going to go with the people who are going to actually figure out how to like make these things interesting. And I don't, you know, I just watched the TED Talk from you, Dustin, where he's like, well, you know, this things could develop in ways that like we don't have, any, you know, it's not like humans at all, except in the desire to freaking kill everyone. Right. Like, what do you, you know, what? So it has none of our, it has, it, it evolves from us. It has none of our capability, you know, has none of our emotions or ideas or shares none of our values, which is absurd. You're already seeing things like with constitutional AI and things that kind of adjust it to the values. Plus, it's trained on human things and trained by human examples. So naturally, we're going to push it in that direction. But it doesn't have any of those values except the desire to dominate all things and kill everything, right? Then there's even been papers about that kind of stuff where they're like, oh, the dominant life form is to eradicate other species. So I'm like, what are you even talking about? Like, the wolves don't evolve to eat all the bunnies or they'd be dead, right? The bunnies don't proliferate so much, right, that the wolves can't eat them. And, 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 and I don't see this. I, I, you, there are even examples of like, you know, a crab and, and a blind sort of like... Uh, you know, the shrimp or whatever working together in the same hole. One of them defends the other. The other one keeps it clean. You see all these kinds of reciprocal relationships in nature. So the, a lot of this is just based on weird speculation. And, and in the past, you had people who were sort of 
gatekeepers on opinion, or basically you didn't get these kind of fringe ideas. And now the exact opposite is true. You get like as soon like the most polemic, the most kind of like black and white thinking, the more black and white you can make us or that kill or be killed or whatever, the more kind of like divisive you can be, the more like insane you can be, the more you're going to get amplified in the media to say like, this is the way it is. Now, it doesn't mean that there are no highly intelligent, like, you know, people, Jeffrey Hint, great respect for, right? You know, these, you know, Yoshio Benjio and, 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 you know, Benjio and, and such, like, these people are looking at, I think, unfortunately, they, you know, they look at it in a more nuanced way, right? Like, I think Jeffrey Hinton said recently, like, you know, if these models, I used to think they were worse than, than human brains, but maybe they're better in some ways, meaning like, uh, they can download the ability to learn a new skill or whatever. And I've seen that as a continual learning possibility for a long time, right? You're a robot and it's like, boom, download the ability to do the dishes, boom, download the ability to walk the dog, right? That's kind of cool. We can't trade ideas like that. And so in some ways they are better. And we do have to be careful. We have to be careful about how we use these things. But I worry more about a dumb intelligence, okay, controlled by a sadistic, nasty human being, than I worry about, you know, an intelligent, like, super machine rising up and having its own desires and escape. Where is it going to escape to? Another eight-way, you know, another eight-way H100 cluster with 768 gigs of RAM, a vector database, and a back end. Like, what, where, people think of it as, like, an in-person or a liquid flowing thing out in the ether that could just flow somewhere else. This is utterly ridiculous. It means you don't understand anything about infrastructure. It makes no sense whatsoever, right? And it, it's just basically, so when I look at these things, I look at, there are real potential problems, and then there's all this utter freaking nonsense that people take seriously. I can't take the paperclip maximizer seriously. I can't take it seriously. I think the Dick Post from Boom is ridiculous. I, I don't know why. I don't know why anybody would use that as an example of like, if, you know, that's not super intelligence, that's super psychotic. And if I'm a super intelligent like robot, I'm not even going to go, you know what, I'm going to become so obsessed that I'm going to turn the whole universe into paperclips. I'm just going to designate that to a sub-process that's dumb that like maximizes paperclip efficiency in the factory and then be done with it. Right? Like that. So none of this makes me, to me, it, it's so much wasted time. So and like, I don't know why they get so much press other than like, it's just like, click, click, click. People like to be afraid. They do. They, they, they're like, we, we are big fear-based creatures. We'd have no art, no skyscrapers, no tools, no war, no kings and queens, nothing without fear. And so this is just the latest thing to be afraid of. Don't worry about it. In 10 or 15 years, they're going to move on to something else to be afraid of. Or next month, right? They're going to move on to something else to be afraid of and some other technology that's going to kill us all. So a lot to unpack here as well. And I, what I, love, <laughs> I love that you mentioned the fridge example because in your writing, you do draw a lot of historical examples of how technology that we now take for granted was looked at as potentially existential risk or as um, highly, highly disruptive of the way we live, right? Maybe would you want to mention some of these examples that we've had in the past where we there's quite a lot of moral panic around these technologies and how does that maybe parallel with the current AI risk discourse? Almost every technology has had a moral risk around it. So like um, teddy bears were going to destroy uh, young women's desires to have babies uh, and to be nurturing mothers because they were going to waste all their time on the teddy bear. Social media has been, you know, uh, uh, destroying us and is every politician's favorite, like, you know, ability to destruct. I would argue that it's a totalitarian system, right? Like we see where there's millions of people trying to desperately control social media versus regular social media, which has some exploits, right? Is, is, um, if the social media is perfectly useful to us, we get all kinds of voices in there and people go, well, you know, I think uh, Sasha Baron Cohen was just on there saying, oh, you know, if Hitler was around today, he'd be running 30 second ads on the final solution. I'm like, yeah, well, guess what? Hitler and Stalin didn't actually need social media to whip up a ton of people into one of the most horrific genocides in history. So that doesn't track for me. Okay. Because, you know, just because you could use a technology that way. Cold technologies were a great example that we used earlier of something that was incredibly disruptive to the jobs at the time, right? And, and that was potentially really dangerous, right? In other words, explosions, fires, these kinds of things in the early days. Cold has absolutely changed the way that we live in civilization. You know, we can live in environments we'd never live in. We have a, a steady food supply. Back when in the 60s, they thought, you know, the population bomb was going to destroy us all. And all of a sudden we have the green revolution, right? But like cold, but the fact that you can keep vegetables and meat cold allows us to have a much steadier food supply 
in the event that you have a bad crop. This is amazing. This is incredible. It's one of the, we are the luckiest 1% of people, 1% of people ever to be alive. The luckiest 1% of 1% of people ever to be alive today. People don't understand this is because of technology. Our, our, our child mortality rate is 4%. It used to be half. You used to, you expect every child, if you had two of them, one of them was going to die in the 1800s, right? You know, like our life expectancy has gone from 30 to 70, right? Because of these, you know, medical technologies and the things that we have now. Antibiotics, chlorination in the water. They went on trial. But John Leal went on trial for putting chlorine in the water, right? Meanwhile, cholera was killing millions of people every year, right? And he went on trial because we were like, you can't do this. It's going to destroy everything. It's going to destroy all the water, right? And of course, like, you know, luckily was acquitted and chlorination is now like, probably dropped child, there was this Harvard study that said it dropped child mortality by 74%, 74%, okay? So every single one of these technologies, when you look at them historically, the, the, the ice industry wiped out the industry, which were huge businesses, of people chopping ice out of rivers in frozen places and shipping it places. And so I'm, I am sorry that those folks uh, don't have don't have a gig anymore, but uh, I do think that like having ubiquitous coal technology was useful, right? And like and like when we invent the electric light, some jobs do go away. Right? This is true, right? But new jobs are created by the possibility of these things. And I I am sorry that the 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 whale hunters are gone, um, you know, and that you know we we don't have to hunt giant leviathans to kill them and dig the white gunk out of their head to light candles. Um, but you know, but I don't know that anyone's clamoring for return to whale hunting. Okay. And, and because like, you know, and because there was disruption. So there are like, actually, and there were huge deb debates over the danger of electricity. Actually, if you read the empires of light, uh, sometimes perpetrated by the people themselves in AC versus DC, you know, where Edison had invented DC, AC was able to make it travel much, much further. And so he tried this smear campaign about how deadly, you know, AC, you know, AC was, and they even got to the point where they were like, you know, electrocuting a dog or whatever in, in public to show how dangerous it was. It's crazy, right? And of course, like AC, you know, is, is this ubiquitous technology that lights the entire world and makes it possible for us to, you know, to, to do things we never would have been able to do. So almost every single technology in the history of man, right, has been like punctuated by some sort of like, you know, sort of moral panic. Think of the, you know, think of the Luddites, right? That, that famous example, you know, we still have, you know, rug makers, you know, who are able to make, a, you know, a custom, beautiful rug and they can charge tons of money for that thing. And we have machines that now make a rug, you know, from Ikea you know, for everybody else. And so what you get is this distribution of things. And, and then the last argument against that people sometimes use is, well, this time is different. And guess what? That argument has been used every single time. Every time is different. I don't think that it's different. The example of like, maybe this time where the horses, you know, uh, to the car and that the horse population radically declines. I, j I just don't see this happening. I, I see this as like, I see if there's, you know, if there's negative uses of AI, there's other uses of AI to counter it. You know, if, if, if AI speeds up malware creation, then, then it's also going to speed up the ability to like auto magically, you know, quarantine the, you know, your, your web software and, you know, you know, when it's infected and, and respond with a new, uh, you know, a, a new update written on the fly to, to kill that thing off. Right. So, so when I look at these kinds of things, I see, you know, the, these kind of super intelligent, these crazy AI things, I go, that's sort of, that's sort of the understanding that AI is going to evolve in a vacuum, like the old Jules Verne version of technology where one guy has the summary. Right. Like for when I look at that's not how technology develops. Like it's not interesting. And, and you saw the sci fi shift in these where it's not interesting if one person has a cell phone. It's only interesting when everybody does. And we're going to have lots of AIs kind of working, counter and doing the other. So, you know, look, all these technologies have, have had some moral panic. And in the long run, I think technology is almost always, almost always beneficial. It doesn't mean that there's never uh, any dark sides to technology. Sometimes people hear me say this and like, oh, you know, you just worship progress or whatever. Well, I, yeah, I, I do. I worship, I worship like, you know, going from 50% mortality of children to 4%. I worship medicine that, that actually works uh, and gets us to 70 or 80 years old. I, work, I, I worship our, you know, the green revolution and our ability to not have to kill 2 billion people uh, like the population Bob was recommending in the 1960s. 
um, I, I, you know, I, I, I yeah, I, I think that's awesome. Um, and so if that means that, that I think progress is awesome, I think that it's true. Does that mean that has never has any downsides so that we should never consider? No, that's ridiculous. Of course, everything does. And we, and, and our best thing is to iterate, move, mitigate, come up with those answers when they happen to mitigate those kinds of things, right? To mitigate the harm of these types of things as they develop. And I, I think that's, that's the beauty of technology and the beauty of progress. I also agree that it's a good thing that we're not killing whales again. Uh, or anymore, <laughs> right? As you mentioned, and I definitely agree with you that it's definitely a good thing, right? All of the technological advances that we've seen, while also acknowledging the downsides of technology. Uh, one thing that you mentioned is, you know, a lot of the arguments that we see from AI doomers today tend to be grounded within, you know, philosophical arguments around super intelligence, things that have not yet happened, and it tends to distract away from current actual problems that are potentially that can potentially arise from highly intelligent systems that we see today. Maybe what are some of the real risks, unpacking that a bit more, about AI tools that you're worried about today, right? And how do you think that we should be approaching risk management when deploying AI models at scale? No, yeah, I think they're open to all kinds of new uh, security vulnerabilities like, you know, prompt injections that we're just starting to deal with, uh, logical flaws that can be exploited to give up secrets, uh, you know, in terms of like a company or something like that. Um, I think that uh, I think we mentioned a couple of these earlier. I think AI being used in lethal systems is, is something we should be really, 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 really cautious about. It's going to happen anyway. Um, even if we ban it, it's going to happen with black budgets. It's something we have to be aware of. I think AI being used in population control, uh, dissident watching on, in totalitarian countries is absolutely like horrific. Uh, I think those types of things are terrible. Um, you know, I, th I think that, you know, it's subject to sort of basic mistakes of logic and reasoning at this point that it's, it's just not, it's not perfect at that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I think I had a log argument with people recently. I, I, I was like sort of against the protest in San Francisco where they were putting cones on the cars to stop them. I'm like, look, these are responsible for zero deaths and people kill 1.3 million people a year and, and 50 million uh, people are injured in cars. And they're like, well, you know, a dog was killed. And I'm like, okay, well, how many people have that's that sucks. Um, I love you know my dog too, and I, I don't want anyone to lose their dog. Um, but like at the same time, how many like dogs have been hit by cars driven by humans? So statistically, they are safer. But again, you know there is some merit to some of the folks who said, hey, you know maybe we pulled the safety drivers out too fast, or maybe they're not quite safe enough. I'm concerned that even if they were 10x safer, people would be like, to, you know, down with the self driving. Whereas I'm like, look, if you cut that statistic I said by half, or cut it down to a quarter that's a million people walking around on the street playing with their kids and their dog. And so I think that we should push forward with those uh, kinds of technologies. But I do think we need to have a higher level. I don't really fully agree with the, the EU AI Act. I think it's overreaching. I think there's a lot of politics involved. I think it creates a lot of bureaucracy. Suddenly social media algorithms are classified as high risk based on an amendment and make some politicking. I think that's kind of nonsense. But I do agree if you're going to put these into their driving heavy machines in the physical world, uh, that could kill things, that there needs to be a higher level of accountability of this thing and a higher level of, of, of understanding of what's happening, a higher level of like keeping the logs, version control, knowing where the data come in, like understanding and giving the investigative tools, you know, to, to, uh, you know, to lawmakers and enforcers of the law to understand these things. If, if they're going to be controlling, you know, the, the settings on a nuclear reactor or whatever, right? This is stuff we should go very carefully in. OK, and there should be high levels of high bars, you know, for these kinds of things. So, yeah, there are real there are real risks and we are wasting our time. Talking about sci fi level nonsense when we could be focusing on stuff that's really important. I couldn't agree more uh, Dan. as we're closing out our episode. I'd be really not to talk to you about, you know, where you think the space is headed and maybe having some predictions for us, uh, you know, given the rapid pace of development of AI, um, I think it's safe to say that things are going to be quite different in 12 months. Where do you think we'll be in 12 months when it comes to, you know, AI, the proliferation of AI, maybe risk coming from AI? I'd love to hear your thoughts here. Look, I, I think it depends on the kind of breakthroughs we see or whether we, uh, or, or whether the technology remains static. In other words, if it's, if it's basically transformers and they kind of learn once and then they're sort of stuck at that level of learning and then you can maybe augment them with external knowledge databases and all that, that's one level that the technology gets us to. That's, cre that's very useful. I think we, even with that level of technology, we see a proliferation of agents uh, and we see sort of a democratization 
of things that we might call things like RPA, right? So RPA traditionally been this big, heavy, ugly lift of, you know, filling in forms or things like that. And, uh, and, and it was kind of, it didn't really work. But now we have these LLMs that can go out, they can read text, they can understand that text, they can do research. Like we, we built a little agent at the uh, Infrastructure Alliance that we fed it 2,000 companies in the near table. It went out and read all the websites. It summarized them. It scored them based on whether they'd be a good fit for joining the IA. That was 95% accurate. We reached out to 50 of them, and 10 of them got back to us. Two folks joined. Now we're expanding out to 200. Those kinds of tools are going to be super ubiquitous. I think these are fantastic. Everybody should be out there working on agents. And, and you don't need a fully autonomous agent. I consider a semi-autonomous agent with a human in the loop having done the decomposition to be incredibly important. I think these are going to be ubiquitous. What could really change your trajectory would be a couple of continual learning style um, breakthroughs, like a post-transformer breakthrough that lets the neural net continually learn on the fly from new information. Um, to me, um, those kinds of things, even if it's something where you do, you know, it's progress and compress and you can download new skills and jam them into the old one, or if it's legitimately learning on the fly, like the liquid neural net, that to me takes us into a whole different because now you have something that's always learning and is able to adapt in real time. That, to me, that takes us to a bonkers level of, of awesome. Um, it, it, but who knows whether that comes around the corner or whether it's there. In the short term, I expect a, a, a huge proliferation of agents, a huge proliferation of kind of like automation of very tedious, boring, you know, details um, in, our, our, in our day-to-day life. And I think that, you know, is just going to be tremendous. At the same time, the infrastructure is going to start to develop more, uh, make it more kind of, you know, stable, ubiquitous. You're going to see a ton of middle rare to kind of like keep these things on the rail. And you're going to just, and, and what you can definitely count on uh, is more and more, you know, crazy nonsense of, of people shouting uh, about like the, the end of the world. Uh, but don't listen. I think these things are going to be, I, I think they're just going to, for the vast majority of use cases, they're going to make drugs easier to discover. They're going to make like transportation, you know, safer. They're going to make like, uh, you know, just it, our day-to-day life where we're like sorting resumes and instead I can have the agent do that and I can just talk to the people I want to hire uh, and save, you know, two hours a week. When I think about the research assistant, that saved us like two weeks of reading like 2,000 websites just to be like, oh God, I was just, oh, you know, reading that marketing. You know, that's super cool. And I just think, um, you know, this is just an exciting time to be alive. If you're not kind of working in this stuff, you don't listen to them. There's going to be no programmers. Like, get in there. We still need brilliant programmers. The hardest part is not writing code. It's coming up with how to think about a program and, and, and break it down. and compose. So get into it even more. Just level up the skill, adapt to it. If you're an artist, you know, don't be worried about this stuff. Just embrace it as part of your tool set. Artists are not going anywhere. We're always going to have artists creating real things, this concept that they're all going to be disappeared. I'm sorry, but it's just not true. Get in there and embrace it as another tool set. It's just going to be like using Photoshop or something else or a paintbrush. It's going to really just be amazing. And I think it's going to be amazing across every industry. And this is one of the greatest times to be alive. And you should just embrace it. Just embrace it with relish and love. I think this is a great way to end today's discussion. Thank you so much, Dan, for coming on DataFrame. It was a really wonderful discussion. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Just wonderful host. Really, really fantastic conversation.